Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary General, for a, a very uh, compelling and engaging address. I look forward to following up on some of these topics with you. And welcome, everyone, to the Heritage Foundation. Um, I'm going to revert to one of my favorite habits, which is to tell a story about Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, and there's, there's always a Rumsfeld story for any topic, that, and I know them. Uh, but he was, of course, sec uh, ambassador to NATO in 1974. And it was an interesting choice for him because Nixon had just won, you know, this massive re-election. And the decision was made for him to become uh, NATO uh, ambassador. And the Washington Post published an article saying Rumsfeld's the dumbest man in Washington. Why would you leave the center of the universe and go off to Brussels? Uh, but he did. This was 73, actually. And then uh, over the summer of 74, had a very interesting experience with the alliance uh, as Watergate was breaking out here in Washington. And the Nixon presidency descended into a paralysis. And the Washington Post published an article saying Rumsfeld's the smartest man in Washington. He got out. <laughs> uh, but what he experienced and what he talked about a great deal in terms of his interest in and value for NATO was the crisis in NATO in the summer of 74. Uh, when he was basically cut off from D.C. because everybody was focused internally on protecting the Nixon presidency. But in Europe, we had a massive crisis between uh, Turkey and Greece, resulting in Greece withdrawing from the NATO command uh, structure. And uh, then Secretary General Lunds basically pleaded with Rumsfeld to go back to D.C. and come up with some kind of resolution to this crisis. And what he knew is if he went back to Washington, no one would talk to him about anything but Watergate. <laughs> so he stayed engaged in, in Brussels and, and always spoke very uh, admiringly about how the alliance functioned through that crisis and kept it from coming off the rails during a very dangerous time in the Cold War when a, a crisis in, in NATO would have been particularly uh, destructive. So my first question to you is, you know, with 75 years of, of this alliance, you know, what was forged in the, you know, sort of the ashes of World War II has emerged as you know, one of the most powerful alliances in history. Is there any accomplishment that you would point to uh, like that summer of 74 accomplishment that is not fully appreciated? First of all, I think actually NATO is quite well appreciated mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and more appreciated now than uh, just a, a few years ago because uh, with a full-fledged war going on in Europe, uh, uh, with uh, uh, China becoming stronger uh, and stronger, uh, I think uh, more and more allies realize the value of standing together. It's as simple as that. When we are together, we are stronger and safer. Uh, all of us, and that applies for Europe, but it also applies for uh, for the United States uh, and uh, and Canada, for North uh, America. Uh, so, 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 and I feel, and then also when you look at the opinion polls, there is actually strong support for NATO across Europe and in the United States. So, of course, there are things that are not as appreciated as they should, but the, in general, I feel <laughs> I feel welcomed all over the alliance and. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and we see it also reflected in, in the fact that allies are investing more uh, uh, in defense. But on that uh, also story from 1974 and, 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 and the crisis caused by, by, by the crisis in, in Cyprus, uh, I think it demonstrates why NATO is the most successful alliance in history. And NATO is the most successful alliance in history for two reasons. One uh, is that we have been able to change when the world changes. For 40 years, we deterred the Soviet Union. Then suddenly, the Soviet Union was not longer there. And people said NATO has to go out of business or out of area. And we went out of area and helped to end two brutal ethnic wars in the Balkans, in, in Bosnia, and Zagovina, uh, and, uh, and um, in, in, in Serbia or, or, or Kosovo. And then after 9-11, uh, NATO did something no one envisaged that we were going to do. And that was to be on the front line fighting terrorism and helping the United States. Um, and then after 2014, NATO has adapted again uh, uh, with more uh, focus on collective defense uh, in Europe, the strongest reinforcement of collective defense. So the first reason why NATO is a success is that we are changing and we will continue to change. The other reason why NATO is a success is that despite our differences, we are able to agree around the core task of NATO, and that is to protect all allies. 
because we are now soon 32 allies from both sides of the Atlantic with different history, different geography, different political parties in, in power, and it changes, and we disagree on many issues. And we have, you know, NATO was founded in 49, and then we had the Suez Crisis in 56. Uh, we had, uh, in the 67, we had uh, France um, asking NATO to leave. Our headquarters were in, were in Paris, and we had to, to move to Brussels. Of course, that was a crisis. And then we had uh, 74, and we had uh, the Iraq War, and we had many differences. And we'll have them in the future too, I promise. <laughs> uh, but despite all these, different, these differences, we have been able to deter every adversary and unite around the core task to protect each other. And because we realized that we, we, realized that we are safer when we stand together. So uh, uh, that's, the, that's, the, that's in a way the key that uh, realizing that we are different, we are uh, still able to protect and defend each other, not to provoke a war, but to prevent the war and, uh, and preserve peace. And NATO has done that successfully for 75 years, and we will continue to do so as long as we adapt to a changing world and as long as we are united despite our differences. And I'm actually going to push back a little bit on that one, uh, because in 2022, deterrence did fail. And I think the you know, the challenge we have to NATO going forward is, you know, why did that deterrence fail? Uh, I think to your point about winning the Cold War and it being a good thing that NATO didn't go out of business after the Cold War because Russia didn't go out of business. And so that threat was still very much present and, as it turns out, gathering. You recently referred to the war in Ukraine as a battle of ammunition. And clearly, you know, we do have allies who have their stocks running dangerously low, and our ability to resupply is not what it should be. What would be your views going forward into the next 25 years of NATO as we approach the centennial about how we can build up that capacity in, in Europe in a way that is interoperable with the United States uh, that, so that we can present a greater uh, deterrence for Russia for any further ambitions uh, that Mr. Putin may have, and how quickly do you think that capacity can be built up? Uh, it's extremely important to, to build up that capacity of, uh, of our defense industries, but let me first briefly um, uh, respond to what you said about deterrence failed. I think we have to be very precise. NATO's deterrence is about Article 5, and that applies for NATO allies. That has never failed, except if you, also we have been, uh, there have been terrorist attacks, there have been cyber attacks, but there have not been any major military attack against any NATO ally. Uh, we will have cyber attacks, we may have terrorist attacks also in the future, uh, uh, but the, the, the core responsibility for NATO to deter uh, military uh, uh, attacks, that deterrence has not failed. Uh, Ukraine is a partner, but Ukraine is not covered by Article 5. So I think it, it, we, should not, we should not confuse uh, those two uh, uh, things, because then we are actually undermining the credibility of Article 5. Because if you say that Article 5 failed in 22, then we undermine the credibility of Article 5. Article 5 didn't fail in 22, also, uh, uh, when, when Russia invaded Ukraine, because Article 5 and NATO's collective defense uh, services does not apply for Ukraine. So therefore, it cannot fail. Uh, that doesn't make the invasion of Ukraine less serious, but, but, but we should not confuse those two things. Uh, second, the war in Ukraine is more and more a war of attrition. And the war of attrition becomes a war of logistics. It's about producing the weapons, the ammunition, the spare parts, the maintenance needed to sustain uh, the war effort. And that uh, demonstrates uh, the need to produce ammunition, to, uh, to, to, because so far we have mainly digged uh, into our stocks to supply uh, Ukraine. That cannot continue, that, also that's not sustainable. So therefore, uh, we started actually uh, yeah, quite early into the war to work with the defense industry about how can we ramp up production. And, and it revealed some serious weaknesses that, that our defense industry on both sides of the Atlantic doesn't have the capacity needed to sustain uh, this type of war and even uh, less uh, big uh, uh, conflict between pair uh, uh, enemies. 
So, so the, the bad news is that we have seen some, 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 some serious gaps. The good news is that allies are now addressing them. The important, uh, and, and production is uh, gradually going up, uh, NATO is playing a key role in two or three ways. First is that we are aggregating demand. We are ensuring that allies, especially the smaller and medium-sized allies, are buying stuff together. Uh, this is helping to uh, reduce the unit cost or the cost per produced unit. The economy of scale is utilized by bigger contracts. Uh, and of course, it increases the market power of those who are buying. So we, we just last two weeks ago, we had a, uh, some allies agreeing to buy 1,000 uh, Patriot interceptors. So it's such a big uh, investment that actually they are building a new uh, factory to deliver those uh, interceptors. Um, um, uh, in total, uh, NATO support and procurement agency just over the last six months have signed contracts worth $10 billion, partly to replenish NATO stocks, but partly also to enable allies to, con uh, to uh, continue to deliver support to, uh, to, uh, to Ukraine. The other important role NATO is playing is that we are setting the capability targets to the NATO defense planning process, and we are setting the standards. And standards are extremely important because we have to ensure that weapons, uh, ammunition, is interoperable. This is part about 155 ammunition, but also, you know, that, that the different systems can talk to each other um, uh, and communicate in a, in a world of artificial intelligence and more and more advanced weapon systems. These has to be NATO standards uh, because we cannot not have different sets of standards for the same allies. Um, and, uh, and the good thing with that is that while having common standards, uh, we ensure interoperability, interchangeability, that we can work together on the battlefield, but also that we have an open defense market. And again, this is a huge advantage for the United States. I mentioned in my speech, 120 billion uh, in sales to European allies and Canada just over the last two years. Uh, and, and later on today, I'm going to Alabama to, to Pike County to, to, to um, Lockheed Martin there, where they are producing javelins, jobs in the United States, uh, support Ukraine, uh, and, and paid by, by, by European allies. So this is a, NATO is a good deal for the United States.